What do you call that noise? We've got the rhythm in our heads. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to a very special edition of What Do You Call That Noise, the XTC podcast, which for one episode has become the XTC podcast with an extra E at the start of it. This episode is being released to coincide with the 2021 online XTC convention. So a big hello to everyone listening there. Well done to the organizers for putting such a great lineup together. Um, after an 18 month pandemic delay, the formidable rhythm machine that is terrible. Chambers is finally out on the road giving XCC Classics the live airing they deserve. Terry is our very special guest on this episode, along with bandmate, frontman, and all round multitasker Steve Tilling. We'll also be hearing from fans who caught the band's gig at the Wedgwood Rooms in Portsmouth on the 7th of September. First, though, as we all know, good music deserves a good accompanying drink. So let's catch up with Karen Neal to find out her recommendation for the perfect drink to match the perfect song. What do you call that noise? Hello, my name is Karen Neal and I recommend pairing the affiliated by the Jukes of Stratosphere with the strong cup of English breakfast tea. Perfect. Thanks for that, Karen. I'm brewing up now. Um, I was able to get down to the Portsmouth gig with the help of the podcast's Patreon supporters, so an extra special thank you to them for that. If you'd like to join them and help keep the podcast going, please check out patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. I'll be name checking the Knights in Shining Karma at the end of this episode. Oh, and just a reminder that you can get my two XTC books at xtclimelight.com. Before we talk to Terry and Steve, let's head to Portsmouth, where just before XDC's gig, I caught up with Julie Matthews, one of the XDC convention's organisers, Margaret Brown, a veteran of several XDC gigs, and Dan Barrow, formerly of the cover band Ecstatic. I started by asking Julie about the XDC convention and her recent trip to Swindon. What do you call that noise? Uh, well, a few weeks ago I popped down uh, to have a chat with Steve Warren and uh, was, I, I'm not an interviewer, uh, I'm just a fan, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that turns out, but I had, had a, a nice chat with him and uh, so I went down with uh, Mike Smith and Joe Turner and Joe did all the, the recording of that because he's uh, you know, professional and knows what he's doing. Um, so yeah, I had a lovely chat with Steve and I think that uh, that's going to go into convention, but I think that's going to be in, in two parts. Um, and, and Steve Warren, for those people who don't know, used to be XDC's roadie back in the day when, when they needed a roadie. Yeah, uh, and uh, earliest sound engineer, so, and he's, he's the man with the, all the recordings of the band that uh, go way back, and uh, yeah, he's a very interesting guy, and I believe he might be driving the van for the gig tonight. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <He> <laughs> <managed> to, <laughs> yeah, okay. I said, oh yes, you've come full circle. So um, It's like a cult, isn't it? Once you're in the XTC sect, you can't get out of it. <laughs> yeah, <together. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there's the interview with Steve. Um, and we'll have some fan performances like last year. Uh, and at the, the gig in Swindon last week at the Vic, I was having a chat with a couple of people who might be submitting some musical works that uh -huh. will be very interesting um but uh yeah I, I don't know how far i've managed to put their arms up their backs yet but again uh, you, you'll hear you'll hear on the evening of the uh, online convention how successful i've been at that and there's artwork as well that you've, uh, that you've been trying to amass from yes the... yes I, i've not been receiving that but uh yeah there, there's been uh some artwork submissions and we're very keen because a lot of people who are into xtc are also artists not just musical but uh, you know physical artwork kind of people uh, a bit like Andy Partridge himself so yeah we thought it'd be a good idea to amalgamate one or two of people's other interests. But for those who attended the fan convention last year they'll know that there's a or they'll assume there's a huge amount of work involved in putting all of that together it, 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 it's good that there's a number of you doing it because I imagine it is a lot of work. Uh, I I don't do a lot to be fair. I mean, Mike Smith shoulders a huge amount of the the burden and, and the admin uh, and and the badgering of people and the organising of stuff. Uh, Joe Turner is, has put an awful lot in in terms of recording and editing. Um, I just sort of turn up and chat to people. That's pretty much what I do. 
share the glory. And share the glory, yeah. <laughs> to share that. And does that because uh, I imagine this year might feel easier than than last year because you, you've now discovered it is possible to do something online and it went smoothly. And, and all yeah, this yeah, I, it, yeah. It went it went pretty well last year. We we had our hiccups. Um, maybe a full run through would have been indicated before we actually did it. But I think people quite enjoyed the uh, sort of Heath Robinson uh, <laughs> effect and the make do and mend. Um, we're all friends together, and I think uh, I think it kind of worked in a in a strange sort of way. Yeah, and it's that lovely thing about. I mean, I keep on thinking back to to me doing the uh, limelight, the XTC fanzine, and the whole idea of a fanzine is it's the fans who put it together, and and lovely that fans are still doing that. They're still you know doing this podcast. They're doing the convention. They're they're, they're and uh, we'll talk to Dan probably about uh, being an ecstatic. But you know, they do the cover bands together. You know, it's that sense of uh, yeah. Of, of, Bottom up, support, yeah. support, and support, hopefully support. next year we'll be able to get together in person. Oh, so then I will be doing something <laughs> because I, I um, was doing the ticketing for the, the original in person event, and I guess I'll probably be doing that again next year. But uh, so yeah. you know, if people can save up their pennies and turn up in person, I think it'll be even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, great that that's all happening. Thank you, thank you for that, um, Margaret. You're um, an ex TC veteran. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them twice now. Once last week and then once um, the week before the first lockdown. So. Basically the only band that you see these days. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they're really, really good live. I'm excited for um, my sisters to see them for the first time tonight and obviously you as well, Mark. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's really not to be missed, so... And and to see well to see any band three times shows a sort of dedication that um, mm. is above and beyond what you would normally expect. And, and but you, are you looking forward to seeing them for a, a third time? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it it doesn't get old to be honest. I mean, it's the seeing you know XTC and the and cover bands and tribute bands. The only time you're going to get to see the songs live. So um, it's just yeah, it's just nice to be around that. And it's also a good excuse to meet up with people and say hello and people that haven't seen throughout the pandemic so yeah yeah and actually I'm, I'm i'm sort of raising an eyebrow but i saw a whole week worth of, of tc and i when they uh, did that run and, yeah. and enjoyed every one of them yeah me too because yeah. you start you start i suppose as, it, as the shows go on you start seeing uh, nuances and slight differences that become interesting yeah yeah definitely have you got any highlights or are you we doing that just with my mom oh, do you want no to spoilers. Spoilers. spoilers no <laughs> are they change are, are they mucking around with the sets or they basically do a carbon copy each time as well I mean you've done twice once before lockdown and once yeah. after haven't you uh, were they yeah fairly similar I think was it exactly the same exactly the same yeah right. it was but um, I don't really think it it makes that much difference they cover pretty much all the bases that you want to see anyway so mm -hmm. it's been a long time between shows yeah, <laughs> been, yeah. and having had that um, base Origins in TCNI, and I, there's a, a a nice sort of fifty fifty balance between Colin and Andy song. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's um, I think it's good as well for the people that um, had their shows cancelled last year that didn't get to go and see them. So it's it's nice that they're not missing out this time round. Dan, your claim to fame. Actually, we've had two of you on the XTC podcast before, which is great yeah. to have. Repeat business. business. <laughs> but, repeat business. Yeah. But, and and the reason Dan you were on it previously was because you were the one of the. Uh, Motivate, or if not the motivating force behind ecstatic. Yes. I'm not going to spell that out, but um, <laughs> you, the, the clue is in the is in the letters there of the XTC XTC cover band. Mm. Uh, d d d I know actually you had a bit of a hesitation about whether you should go and see effectively another cover band, even albeit with the original drummer in it. Yes. Um, is it is it busman's holiday is not the right phrase, is it? But um, is there is there a sense of oh. oddness about seeing? The There's a good question. So There's a good question. I. It, in the one in the one way, I think it was that I kind of felt like I'd been there and done that, and I went way down the XTC rabbit hole and tried to personify Andy Partridge as the best of my limited ability, and then I almost went round the bend doing it. So the thought of actually going back and seeing someone else doing it does make me feel you know, sort of this slight trepidation. But if I think about when I went to see TC and I, and within ten seconds. I knew it was going to be okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> I knew this was going to be one of the best nights ever, and it was. Yeah. Uh, and for the same reason, I'm really excited to see them tonight as well and just see what they're doing with these tunes, knowing firsthand, as I do, how intrinsically difficult they are mm -hmm. to bring alive mm -hmm. life. Of all, of all the band members, Terry James has got that professional 
history. He's played at big venues. He's you know with XTC they were playing every night for felt like uh, sometimes for, for for ten years or something. And and that professionalism means that it puts him. I imagine maybe maybe um, Julia and Margaret can answer this question. It, it it puts it brings a level of professionalism that that you wouldn't necessarily expect from you know a few people who've got together, a few fans who've got together to to do covers. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think Steve helps with that as well because yeah. he just Steve is just Steve and does his own thing, and and um, it's not like um, he's he's not he yeah I don't really know how to describe it but he's just he's very uh Terry's so in his performance style. solid uh, and and yeah I think that allows uh Steve to feel more secure in in sort of playing his way although although you know he was taught by Andy Partridge himself wasn't he to play a lot of uh, the XT well, songs helps. but uh hmm. yeah I mean uh, Terry having sort of been in the business for so many years yeah, there is that aura of yeah this this is a real band but yeah. it's it's not just because it's just Terry it's the ensemble yeah. you know, yeah. everybody together really really good quality stuff yeah yeah uh, and Margaret when you were on the podcast before we were it was there because you've been classified by me as a young person which is probably horrible <laughs> for me to do so uh, well, but one of the things that uh, Terry says is that this is an opportunity to introduce the, the band's music you know over 20 years after they even finished to a younger generation, uh, I don't know whether the, whether you were spotting other people of your age who were at the um, the Swindon gig, uh, or, or but is is it your feeling that they are reaching out to a younger generation? You know? I think definitely, yeah. I think um, it just makes it a lot more accessible if you if you can go and see someone live. And um, you, my friend um, who who lives in Portsmouth, she goes to uni here. She messaged me the other day saying, "Oh, there's this gig that I really want to go to um, at the Wedge." and and I was like, oh, who is it? And she said, oh, it's XTC. And I was like, oh, funnily enough, <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Unfortunately, she couldn't get a ticket. But, oh, it's a shame. Um, but yeah, it just, I think it just goes to show, like, it's, uh, it's getting out there and it's, um, it's reaching a lot, a lot more people. And I think that if XTC hadn't formed, then that wouldn't have happened, I don't think, necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think there is, my perception anyway, is that, that just the history of rock and roll is such that now everything's up for grabs. Whatever age you are, you can, you can you've got the history to, to pick and choose from, and it doesn't matter if it's from nineteen seventy three or nineteen eighty three or whatever. The, yeah, the, you can dip in and out yeah. wherever you wherever you want to. Yeah, yeah. It's something very special though when you hear someone of younger than you that has discovered the same thing that you discovered. I mean, I came late to XTC, you know, relatively um, way after they stopped. Um, touring obviously but it's really nice when you hear and you read it on the various forums and Facebook groups where you go oh thanks for letting me join this group I really love XTC and you go yep welcome welcome yeah, come yeah. one come all yeah, yeah and it's a nice feeling it just carries the carries the torch yeah well I think one of the nice for me one of the nice reasons is because it sort of justifies my it, it isn't just I mean, there's an element of coincidence that I happen to be listening to them at, the, at a formative age at the age of 15 or whatever mm. which is when you are very impressionable for sure but it's nice to realise it wasn't just because I was 15 and just because the p- other people have discovered them later on in completely different circumstances. Mm. So, sure, it just to you. Well, we're all looking forward to tonight, mm-hmm. I can yeah. tell. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for uh, talking to me and uh, uh, hope I'll catch up with you at the end of the game to see whether it fulfilled our expectations. Oh, yeah. I'll be <laughs> <slowly Great>. and... <laughs> <laughs> And um, everybody have a good convention as well if this is if you're listening to this at that time. Yeah, enjoy. Thanks, Mark. No worries, thank you. What do you call that noise? Thanks, Julie, Margaret, and Dan. Now for the main event. It's time to hear from Terry Chambers and Steve Tilling on their inaugural tour as XTC. I started by asking Terry whether he thought there had been anything good about the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you call that noise? Why do you call that noise? Not really, because um, we weren't able to rehearse and um, those type of things there. So the preparation for the gigs that we're doing at the moment was very late in coming because of, um, you know, the restrictions and so on and so forth. So... It was a very difficult period of time, as it was for many others. Um, and everybody within the group, I think, um, just sort of played with themselves at home, for the want of a better expression. 
Um, so yes, it was it was um, very difficult because I can imagine, particularly particularly for you of all people, in fact the two of you that that you you'd hit that peak where you were. I was due to see you in Edinburgh. That gig never happened, but you did do the warm up gigs in in, in Swindon. And then it stopped, and then and then there was a long eighteen month delay before right now. You've now done two gigs since then, I think. Yeah, I that mean, must have been weird. Exactly. I mean, uh, the two gigs that you're referring to took place on the 9th and tenth of March last year. And then I think it was the week weekend following that that uh, all hell broke loose with this COVID thing. And um, well, I just put a stop to everybody's activity, really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from that, I mean, it took a, a while to understand exactly what the requirements were you know and I thought well it's this sort of basically going to be like stuck in your bedroom rehearsing again as you did as a 14 and 15 year old uh, adolescent you know so it's sort of um, back to the egg really yeah 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 and with as a drummer do you do that thing of sort of drumming on the on the pillows rather than drumming on actual drums no I've, I've got some drums that uh, I play and they're all stuffed with bubble wrap and one thing and another so um um, try and minimise the noise, but um, yeah, it's a difficult instrument to try and uh, uh, keep some sort of control over in a in, a, in an enclosed environment such as a bedroom or whatever. So, um, yeah, <laughs> especially for you as one of the the the, the world's great loudest drummers. Or... Well, I've had, to, I've, I've had to readapt as a result of that, really. Uh, and and age has not uh, been been my my friend either <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about you steve has, has, uh, 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 how did you find that sort of break in the momentum because i just imagine as a band you get everything together and yeah. then you're all poised to go and then to stop is tricky i mean yeah the there are a lot of negatives uh the the biggest as, as like terry said you know we worked up to that stage uh we had offers coming in we had a tour in america lined up like you say, Edinburgh, and it's, you know, it's finally happening. You know, we're going to get out there and do this. And, uh, and then, of course, everything shut down. So it was quite a, a depressing time, really, you know, uh, just sitting around, still playing the songs, but as Terry said, on your own. Uh, but, you, you know, and you're thinking, well, when is this going to end? Because the people were saying, oh, it's got to be gone by autumn. Well, autumn came and went and it was still there and, so, you know, it seemed like a never ending thing. But on the plus side of all this, I think if there is a plus side, <laughs> um, it's given us a chance to get the exact right lineup because I couldn't be happier with the people we've got on board now. And uh, we've actually tightened up a lot more, I think, um, through having that extra time, you know. So that is a, you know, it doesn't outweigh the negatives, of course, but uh, yeah, it's allowed us to hone things even more yeah and just getting that sense of perspective about what you're doing and, and where you've right. got to yeah yeah xtc songs no matter how often you revisit them you'll always find uh, a little nuance in there that you haven't spotted before and you think why have i never heard that you know so it's a process of constant refinement you know let, let's start off talking about the musicians and, and seeing as the both of you are here let's talk about each other yeah. <laughs> steve what's it like to have terry behind you playing Oh, incredible. Uh, he's, well, he's the best drummer I've ever played with, you know. He was just a remarkable musician. Uh, but unlike any other drummer I've known, Terry thinks musically rather than just, oh, like, this will do. He's always looking to punctuate certain sections of songs and highlight, or he's always thinking dynamically, like bringing things down and raising them up and building the energy. Uh, he thinks like an all-round musician. And of course, like you say, he, it's the power as well that you get with Terry, um, and that solidity that you won't get with a, a jazz drummer. Yeah, and, and I love it. And to be honest, that's my favourite style of drumming. It's that um, it's not overly flamboyant, but it holds everything together, and it it punctuates certain sections. As I say it's dynamic and and so musical. So yeah, I mean, he, he's exceptional. Yeah. Is that gushing in the except, uh, except this blank check. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I, well, I'll agree. Do, do you recognise yourself in that, Terry? Is that a description that you you can see yourself in? No, I think I think he was looking at um, Brian Downey when he was sort of talking about that, or Ian Pace, perhaps. 
Not at all. Not at all. You're a legend. A legend. Actually, I was thinking I was going to ask you about Charlie Watts because Charlie Watts has only just uh, passed away, hasn't he? Do you was he a big influence on you? Well, like everybody um, that um, played drums, I think um, at some point in time you've got to come across Charlie Watts and Ringo Starr and Buddy Rich, and 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 there's half a dozen or more guys that um, you know you can't really play the instrument without sort of crossing or listening to what those guys have done so yes to answer your question yes charlie watts was an influence because uh, the, the the 50 odd years of of recording that they did um i don't know i mean it's still the test of time and um he was still playing extremely well right up until the end i believe so i mean what's not to like about that yeah yeah and uh, yeah, and bringing his own style, but not being so flamboyant that he wasn't a Keith Moon. No, absolutely not, and he didn't need to be. You know, I mean, it just fit fit uh, the Rolling Stones perfectly. Um, you know, and, and when he wasn't playing the Rolling Stones, of course, he was a jazz player. So he obviously was very musical and did exactly what was needed for the likes of uh, Keith and Mick. Uh, their their songwriting style. I mean. Um, you just can't imagine anybody else doing it, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And do you recognise in yourself that thing that Steve just said about you, about being a musical player? Well, I think that may have uh, come a little bit later on. I think uh, in my early days, I, I didn't consider myself to be too musical. It was sort of like more or less an energetic um, uh, thrash, really, um, because that was the music of the time. And I think as um, you become older and... Um, the songs become a little bit more complex, then you have to sort of um, move move along with it. So um, I suppose I, I'd like to think I've become a better drummer as a result, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, so well, actually, you're sitting next to Steve. How, how, how you, and I'm just going to think it's 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 a it must be an odd thing for you because you were with a very tight knit group of people from 1972 to to 1982, uh, and then. Uh, and then here you are with uh, a with TC and I and now with XTC that 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 um, you've got people filling the roles that were previously filled by by people that you knew very well. How how is it like? How is playing having Steve in front of you? Well, it's fantastic because Steve and I became associated when uh, Colin and I were doing the TC and I thing, um, and Steve just sort of fit in with that situation. He was the first guy that. Um, um, we, we were um, advised to sort of look, look at when we put, put that group together and um, he just fit in straight away and um, as a result of uh, the TC and I think or Colin's reluctance to sort of continue on um, playing in the live situation uh, I said to Steve I said look this is just too good a thing not to continue on you know um, it's, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because obviously we've got to replace an ex-original member of XTC. Uh, but, you know, we had such fun doing that that we just felt it was the right thing to do to continue on because we enjoy each other's company as well as uh, playing together. Which is crucial given your own track record of being with a, in a band of, of mates, people who got on with each other when Absolutely. you were Absolutely. I mean, it's the only way to go. You have to get on with people. There's no egos involved with this. And Steve's not only is a great guitar player, but he's a fantastic singer too. Um, you know, uh, good all round egg. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's great to play with. He's saying I stink. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a Steven is a good egg. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's taking his fingers out of his ears now. So uh, exactly, yeah. stop blushing. Yeah. And while you stop blushing, you could maybe talk about Steve Hampton and Ken Wynn. What do they bring to the? the lineup ken is a well, he's not originally born in swindon but he lives in swindon uh i mean we as a bit of an aside we, we've had uh, a lot of false starts with the band getting the right people so we you know we went through quite a lot of bass players an embarrassingly long list of, of potential band members but um we settled on ken again because as Joe said you know it's about being friends as much as being in a band together and he's a lovely bloke, um, great sense of humour, 
and a brilliant bass player. Um, you know, he ticks all those boxes, and there are a lot of boxes to tick with a with a band like this. You know, you've got to be very competent musically, but also not uh, not impossible to be on the road with. You know, and um, Ken is a lovely chap, and uh, yeah, so that's Ken. Um, Steve, now like bass players, we've been through a lot of potential candidates for guitarists as well, uh, for various reasons. Um, got a bit desperate, really, um, with the uh, with the last guitarist we had that didn't work out. Uh, so in desperation, I I went onto Facebook and just messaged anybody I thought was even vaguely connected to music. And said, do you know of anybody who would be interested? You know, and unfortunately, a chap called Simon got back to me. And through various uh, routes and circuits, he uh, put us in touch with Steve Hampton, who lives in Portsmouth. But again, a a great bloke, uh, brilliant sense of humour and uh, fantastic uh, guitar player and and singer as well. He fronts his own band called uh, Dead Crow Road and he's an exceptional musician. so yeah, and it's just a, a joy to be in a band with these people. So it's all round to his after the Portsmouth gig then? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add about those two musicians, Terry? No, they're great guys. Um, and incredibly uh, to find people like that. I, I never thought it was going to be possible because as Steve said, I think we, we went through about 13 different individuals. In, in the short period of time that we've been been uh, putting this thing together. So it hasn't been easy, but uh, when, when you look at what you need to, 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 to be able to do to be in this group, you know, one thing is you have to be a reasonably, uh, you know, uh, XTC fan, I guess, because if, if you don't like the music, then there's no point doing it. So, you know, so they're, they're pretty hard to find too. <laughs> yes, I know a few of them, but not... And then people that are prepared to... Um, play the stuff and can play the stuff. So it's it's a difficult ask. Uh, but these guys have sort of come to the fore and um, up, up to this point so far, yeah. I mean, we've only done, what, we've done two gigs now? Yeah, yeah two. two yeah. Uh, but it, it's all sort of gelling quite quite nicely together at this point in time, um, culminating in, in this um, Isle of Wight gig. Uh, that's what these gigs are, are, are leading up to, really, that and the 100 Club. They were sort of like the prize at the end of it. Um, so it's a question of sort of playing modest sized rooms there because we didn't really know how many people would, would come out to see us or would be interested. So we've tried to keep that our, our feet firmly on the ground with that those expectations. Um, and then we're hoping that um, the 100 Club in London and the Isle of Wight will open more doors for us and uh, give us a better look at um, where we sort of sit in this musical world. Um, one of the people who was at your Swindon gig last week uh, it was Jamie Dunn, who's a big supporter of the podcast. And he emailed me and he said, one thing I was impressed with was the accuracy that Terry gave to the songs he didn't play on, as in, in the recordings. He kept everything very faithful to his ears and even switched to the correct mallet sticks on Sacrificial Bonfire, for example. Uh, so his question is, would he, he'd like to know if he if Terry did have to make any compromises for simplicity or if he just rose to the challenge each time. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite, once again quite difficult to, uh, trying to f- emulate... Um, Many different drummers that XTC had on their on their various records after I left. Um, so, and all each each one of them were fantastic drummers in their own right. And um, I've just tried to put my trying to keep reasonably faithful to to the originals. I guess for the want of um, making sure that the, the people that come and see us are not disappointed. But having said that, also trying to give it my own my own twist if you like uh, because i can only really sort of play in one sort of particular style whereas the guys that um, played on all these various records dave maddox for example and chuck sabo peter phipps pat pat mastelotto all these sort of guys uh, you know they're just sort of wonderful in their own right and to be able to sort of like um have to sort of pick the the eyes 
out of what these guys are capable of doing is quite a difficult thing in itself. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that um, that Mr. Dunn was, was suitably impressed. <laughs> he was convinced anyway, yeah. It's all smoke and mirrors, though. It's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're not playing to a you're not playing to one of those uh, you know in those big stadium gig- gigs where these you know uh, mainstream pop stars end up having to mime to everything and pretending that they're just playing. No, as, well, I mean the thing is we we want to maintain a human element to this thing because um, you know we we we're trying to get audience participation involved as well, which in, entails sometimes slowing songs down and and dropping out and getting people involved with this thing. And you can't do that with a click track. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're just, we're just trying to be a good rock band. Mm-hmm. And and Steve, is that your experience from being in rehearsals? Try, do, have you spent a lot of time sort of analytically working out exactly what went on on the records or have you been looser than that? Um, well, Yeah. Well, you, you do have to compromise in the end. I mean, a lot of the, the work that I did preparing for TCNI playing live, it was a matter of putting everything into Pro Tools and trying to forensically analyse the guitar parts. And of course, I was the only, well, Gary Bamford did play occasional guitar, but most of the time it was just me on guitar. And, and of course, original XTC, Dave and Andy, they're very knotty intertwined guitar parts going on so the the clearest route i could find through that was to pick out the most prominent hooks guitar hooks and and melodies and chords and focus on those because you just can't do them all you know so it's those that are going to stick out most to my ear and hope that they're the hooks that other people want to hear as well um so there is yeah there are especially in the later xtc period where everything was very layered um so many guitars. I mean, I think Colin said there was about 20 acoustics on one of the songs that you were doing. So, you know, you'd, you'd have to be an octopus really to even scratch the surface of, of that sort of level. So you, you you basically do have to hone it down and, and get across the main parts. So I think, you know, it's a balance really, like like most things in life, you know. And there were no octopuses available this time no, around. No, unfortunately. <laughs> Nobody on Facebook that was eight, eight limbed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've just kept the thing to um, the basic uh, rock format, which is um, the, the two guitar, bass and drum situation. And we're rocking these things out a little bit better, I think. Um, you know, XTC obviously got really well carried away with uh, the production on these stuff, knowing full well that they would never have to reproduce it live in a, in a real sense. Um, I, I, I know they did a few TV things and that, but, um, you know, they had backing bands as well that involved all that. So and we didn't really want to sort of get in ourselves in a situation where we were going to take sort of eight or ten musicians on the road. I mean, basically... We're sort of like at this point in time, we're sort of like a pub club band type of thing. There, just going to ply the ply our trade out there with the uh, the hope that maybe we can take it to um, a slightly bigger level. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about making compromises, but the other side of the equation, as you say, Terry, is that if you're if you're playing songs live that have never been played live before, you can actually give them a bit of welly and character that maybe they, that might, in some ways, uh, some aspects of it, improve it. Absolutely. I mean, even when when I was with, with, with playing live with XTC, um, you know, corners had to be um, cut in some regard uh, because you've only got four musicians out there sort of replicating this stuff. So, um, as Steve said, you you need to be able to sort of hone in on on what people are really listening to you know the melody and 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 that type of thing and um so far the two gigs it's been very um, responsive from the from the audience participation part part point of view so it's very encouraging what we're doing so far i think that's right if we can substitute you know uh, the, the intricacies that you might hear on the record with energy and excitement and crowd involvement because like Terry said, we see ourselves as a rock band. We want to go out there and give people, you know, the best night of their lives, really. You know, that's what we aim to do. And uh, and just make it an experience for everybody that they're, they're not going to forget, you know. And, and they won't miss the harpsichord on a song or, <laughs> you know, the nose flute on another. It yeah. won't matter to them. You know? uh, do you th- feel a responsibility, Terry, to to the XTC legacy you're the you're the one person in the band who has the connection with the original band do you feel uh as though you've got a lot riding on your shoulders uh 
To a certain extent, yes. Um, I, I know how good the band was when we were playing live, but that was down to the fact that um, we, we toured constantly and we were sort of road hardened. And um, during that period of time there, Andy, Dave and Colin, um, you know, cut out some of the uh, fat and kept the lean, so to speak. Um, and this is what we've had, had to do with, with this stuff, even even perhaps to more of an extent, you know, uh, because as I say, the earlier stuff there was written and you, you were obliged to go on the road to sell these things, to sell the, the records. So later on when they didn't have to do that, obviously they threw the kitchen sink at some of these things and they didn't have to worry about it. But um, for us, for me anyway, to replicate some of those things there, I think we're making a good fist of it so far. Um, as I say, and, you know, you need to trim these things down quite considerably. But um, as Steve said, you know, they're sort of packing a punch. And um, I think um, we need to sort of like put the energy there, uh, play these things as well as what we possibly can do, and hopefully get the um, the 20 extra musicians at least singing along from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be doing that tomorrow night. Does, have you, have, Steve, have you... Um... Uh, have, uh, you, you've seen the intensity and the the passion and the obsessiveness that of all bands that XDC fans have. Uh, d- do you feel that responsibility? Yeah, hugely. It's um, well, you can't think about it too long, or else you'd never get on stage. No, through because I know you know I'm an XTC fan. I know people want to see Andy up there. They want to see Dave and Colin. Um, I would pay good money myself. Um, but, you, you know, I, I can't be a carbon copy of Andy or Colin. And I think if I tried, it would be uh, be a bit cheesy if I did try to do that. So I I can only interpret these songs my way and, and give it the best I can in, in the style I have. I do try to stay faithful to it. But, you know, a lot of the... I, nobody can hiccup like Andy could in the early days. You know, I can't do that sort of seal bark thing very well. So I, I try and emulate it, but it's not slavishly copulate, copying it. I said copulate then. Copulating it. No, that's all right. That's Freudian. It's, it's, it's a family, it's a family <laughs> show. Yeah, I don't like to copulate on these he's songs. Just, um, <laughs> he's, he's human, you know. <laughs> yeah there's a hell of a responsibility and you know it, it, it does feel like uh sometimes there the audience is there taking notes and tutting mm. and uh but you've got to get it out of your head and just crack on and do the best you can there's only a few people within the audience i think that have never seen the original xdc anyway so what they're getting really is is um you know, good bang for their buck, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. You're obviously never going to get the the original band back together again. That's not going to happen. So it's sort of like this is as close as what you're going to get, I reckon. But in terms of, of like you're saying, doing justice to it, you know, I think XCC are one of the most uh, underrated bands. I know that's a comment, but it's true. You know, the quality of their music and uh, the songwriting and the playing and, I mean... To learn an XTC song is like relearning the guitar. You have to rewire your brain. It's unique. There's a uniqueness to XTC. You just won't find in any other band. And I, you need to do that justice. You, And I think that's a part of the problem we've had in finding the right people. Because on the surface, you could approach somebody and think, would you like to do it? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of work involved. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. But when they come down to it, you know, there's a lot to absorb and learn uh and and to do it justice you know and it's a it's a big task to ask of anybody so i'm always very conscious of that i i don't want to um tarnish the legacy of of this band at all i, I want to do the best i can and uh keep the music alive really you can be a fan and you can like the music and whatever and but when you do what you're doing which is to to pick these part songs apart in absolute detail you they could sort of all just fall apart in front of you and you could lose your interest in them or you could be this is a leading question i suppose or you could be uh you know even more impressed by the depth and the quality of them is is i i, I imagine it's the latter yeah it is yeah definitely like i said i think i said earlier no matter they're the sort of bandit no matter how often you li- listen to them you put your headphones on 
and you'll hear a bit you've never heard before, a harmony or a note or a, the way the guitars are uh, complementing each other, and, or, you know, it can be various things. But, yeah, it's such a, an incredible eye for detail, the band, um, and, and quality. You know, some of the parts, Dave Gregory came up with, almost like a classical composer, that, that level of musicality. And Andy is, is, is just a unique musician and songwriter that you you think, well, they, they were young blokes doing this. That's that's another level of talent. You, yeah, it's very rare, very rare to find. Um, yeah. And that's become increasingly clear. <laughs> and how do you find, is, is Terry, is it, uh, in some ways, are you like a new XDC fan? Because there's a lot of this material that you didn't pay much attention to when you were in Australia and so on. And so you had a chance to, to catch up and discover stuff that you, that, that maybe wasn't that, that uh, familiar to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I never really got to, um, to listen to um, many of those albums after I left. And uh, I only sort of like became aware of them when I got involved with Colin doing the TC and I stuff. And he suggested that, um, you know, would you like to sort of like play some of these things live? Because he he wanted to hear some of his songs that he'd written after I'd sort of like uh, taken my leave of absence from the group. Um, he wanted to hear what they sounded like live. So I, I, I really sort of got started with that, really. And then when... Colin decided that he'd heard enough and thought, well, I've heard these songs now. Steve and I thought, well, it was madness not to continue on with, with that as, as as basically being half of the set and then put um, what we sort of deemed to be and is more, um, um, more, well, arguably favourable or commercial songs to the second part of the list. So it's it, the... the, the um, the gigs that we're doing, where we're doing about an equal share of 50-50 of Colin and Andy's songs. So, um, yeah, I mean, it it, it, um, it really came from doing the original um, gigs with Colin in the TC and I sense that Steve and I first sort of became aware of of, of these new XTC songs for for for, uh, for me anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And are there uh, among those new ones? Are, are there some that you wish you'd actually been in the recording studio doing it yourself? Yeah, I mean, there is a point where um, I did leave when when XTC were doing the Mama record there because I I didn't think that um, a lot of those songs quite measured up to what the English Settlement record did. I mean, um, uh, that, that's just sort of like a personal opinion. Um, the record didn't sell as well as what the, uh, the the English settlement record did, and they were obviously moving in a different sort of musical direction. But I think after that, I think um, yeah, yeah, there's some great songs that they did on on on, on many of the re- the records. And yes, um, I would like to have played them, and I would probably play them slightly differently. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, you know, that was a direction that Andy and Colin wanted to go in, sort of more orchestrated type stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say for a minute that I could have done any better, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Can you can you name any particular song that, that you found particularly, uh, either inspiring because it, because you like playing it or, or just difficult because, because you haven't played it before? Um, well, challenging, but um, as I say, I've I've sort of picked the bones out of these things there, and um, you know because there was lots of overdubs and there was some drum machines and all sorts of things there, so I've had to sort of like humanise this uh, in a sense of um, what can um, you know a couple of arms and legs do with this thing there, you know, um, going back to the octopus situation. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what can you actually do with this to make a fist of it? And um, some of the songs I think we've sort of steered clear of, thinking that perhaps, you know, in order to do these things justice, we may need the help of uh, extra musicians or whatever. So I think with the, the songs that we're doing there, um, you know, we, we make a, a reasonably good job of them, I think, there. And, and, and those are the songs that we've chosen to do at this point in time. One that strikes me is Mayor of Simpleton. You do a cracking job on that. Yeah, I think. Here, take this ten pound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. One of those. Ones, I thought uh, King for a day sort of like got an odd sort of like a shuffly thing, and I'm not particularly good at shuffly things. 
But um, that was a bit of a challenge there, just sort of trying to get that to swing a bit, you know. But uh, I feel better for it now. <laughs> like, some sort of, some, like some sort of therapy. There you go. You don't feel so bad about it now, do you? Well, actually, I mean, I can imagine, particularly, again, for, for you of all drummers, Terry, because certainly back in the day you were so athletic, it must feel like a workout by the time you get to the end of a, of a set. And it's a big set that you're doing here. I mean, it, is it quite therapeutic to get to the end of the night and... Well, I'm only playing at 50% now, so uh, <laughs> no, that's not really true. No, um, I sort of pace myself a bit, and, and and it's not as energetic as what it used to be. Um, you know, we used to sort of do pro- probably an hour set or something like that, and it was all pretty frantic. So um, now it's sort of, I think we've sort of matured and, and we're managing the thing a little bit uh, a little bit better to our, to our um, physical needs at our age. You still unleash the fury when necessary, don't you? When I'm angry, when I'm angry, yeah. You know. <laughs> he, he's very uh, what's the word? Humble is our Terry. Well, he's, uh, I mean, I, I, it's just an honour to be in a band with him because the and you've still got that energy, which is the vital part of XTC. I think you know is, is that not just great songs, but the the driving force of it. And Terry is that man. He's the engine room. That's very yeah. kind of you. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it, it, kind of thinking about that. If you it, was there a point, Terry, like really early on in the nineteen early nineteen seventies, where you stopped being, you know, just some kids mucking around on their instruments and started taking on a kind of professional attitude. Well, yeah, I mean. Um... We were sort of like surprised ourselves that um, we actually got a record contract, you know. Um, we sort of got um, uh, involved, I suppose, with the punk movement, d- despite the fact that um, we weren't a punk band. Um, but th- those were the only type of bands that were getting like live gigs in and around the London area at that particular point in time. You know, if you weren't playing that type of music, it was difficult to sort of get, uh, you know, on that pub circuit. You know, I think certain clubs had uh, different nights that they would put things on. For example, I mean, Dire Straits were going around around that time as well. And obviously they were in a punk band and um, a few others. But it was quite difficult for them. I mean, for example, there was a band called The Babies. I mean, they had to basically leave leave the UK and go to the United States because the type of thing that they were doing, there was just no real demand for it over here, you know? So, um, you know, people were sort of like leaving the place <laughs> in on mass, you know, I mean, even people, people like Fleetwood Mac decided to leave uh, the United Kingdom and set up camp in the United States. Super Tramp were another one. They were all sort of disappearing because it was over for them. But, um, you know, seriously though, uh, you know, those bands were always going to maintain their market and that. But from our point of view, we more or less went on the coattails of this punk thing because, you know, that was a way to get the gigs. And, um, you know, as soon as when we turned up, you know, and, and, and clearly we weren't a punk band, you know, it met with some um, derision, I suppose <laughs> is the right word to, to use, with um, some of the disappointed punks. And uh, you don't want to get on the wrong side of a disappointed punk. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking from experience there and, and oh, like but yeah. at at the point when you were signed uh, uh from what i've heard of bootlegs and stuff that, that you were you were a tight outfit you were you were you had a professional attitude you were working hard uh did had that arrived early on in the in your like pre-signing days yeah i mean we you know we admired all, all sorts of bands and and uh, the thing that we admired about certain bands without going into immense detail of, of of because we were all influenced by different groups but uh the one common denominator was that all those bands could play and they were all as tight as and most of them were gig hardened you know they were constantly touring bands so and, and this to us was the secret to to becoming a good band you know you can't do these things in your bedroom you've got to go out there and um you know, throw your your hat in the ring and uh, be exposed for what you are, you know, and then suddenly you realise that perhaps you're not as good as what you thought you were because you go and support some other bands and think, shit, you've got to um, raise your game, 
you know, if you're going to be taken seriously about this, you know, you you just got to get better. And I think it was a result of supporting other bands thinking, well, you know, we've really got to take this to another level if we if we're going to try and do anything with this at all. I think Thin Lizzy was like that. Thin Lizzy. Absolutely, yeah. Bands yeah. like Thin Lizzy and that were the, you know, there was many bands going around in the in the seventies there the, on the college circuit, as you probably well know, Mark, and seen many of them. And uh, yeah, and and it was just a phenomenal time to be sort of around watching bands because every band seemed to be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you look at the. That sometimes people are put on Twitter and Facebook. They'll put a list of, like, an original advert for bands that are playing in, you know, such and such a small venue, or whatever. And it'll be Blondie one night, The Beat the next night, XTC the next night, Thin Lizzy the next night. You know, it's just like every one of the bands you would want to go and see today. Absolutely. I mean, the list was sort of phenomenal. You know, um, and I'd like to think that. Um, you know, those days may come back because um, all these things sort of tend to go in full circle. I think it's uh, we're at a time at the moment there where everything is uh, orchestrated and click tracked and all in time and all this, that and the other. I think, you know, I, I do believe that it'll get to a point there where people want to see real musicians playing real instruments in real time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, quite often, you um, it's some of the mistakes that are made there that um, prove to be quite interesting and um, and um, make these things real. And I think this generation at the moment there, I think they're missing out musically on, on some of these things here. It's okay to go to these huge concerts and all that where everything's choreographed and and all this sort of business there. And, and it, it, it's like sort of seeing a film set, you know. But there's something about sort of like rolling up your sleeves and, and getting into a club or a pub there where people are crammed in and uh, the atmosphere is fantastic and, you know, the band's cooking and there's something there. And I think this generation, it'd be disappointing for them if they go through their musical life without experiencing such a thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And do you think having having been... Uh, I, I keep on thinking, you know, if you see people again on social media, they'll be saying, oh, XTC never played live. And I'm kind of thinking, XTC did nothing but play live for, exactly, for 10 absolutely. years. It was I mean, relentless. You were talking for three years. I don't know if band that did that. <laughs> no. I mean, no. In, the end, uh, in the end, it sort of like brought Andy, Andy to his knees. I mean, it was simple as that. It was bad management. Mm-hmm. Had he been managed properly with a little bit more humane thought going into it instead of just sort of let's strike while the iron's hot and, and grab as much money as we can there and get the cash and dash you know if we had a management company that uh realized that it was human beings behind all this and and andy was suffering from had some issues the whole thing could have been quite different mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and maybe this is a question for for steve because to be working alongside Terry, who has had what I'm, I'll call a professional experience, you know, a, 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 you know, at the top end of the game, playing brilliant. I saw XTC twice and brilliant gigs, uh, 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 and knowing what that professional standard was, does that make him uh, an exacting musician to work with because he knows what what standards uh, you yeah. should be aspiring to? I mean, you don't thrash me with a bit of birch. Every rehearsal. <laughs> um, only when I well, I'm not to. I'm not gonna see you after all then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um yeah, he's but all in a good way. I think you know, working with well from TC and I really was a bit of an eye-opener about the, the diligence and the work ethic. You know, you'd turn up nine o'clock in the morning and it was working day and and you put everything into it and uh yeah. I, I really admire Terry because he has that eye for detail. He's not slapdash about anything. He's always thinking about, well, what if I do a crash there? What, which symbol, should, even what symbol should I use? Do you think that one sounds better on that one? Or, you know, um, should I do this on the toms here? No, uh, I, I, I sort of try and stare at Steve's vocal way, if you understand what I mean, because... There's, there's nothing more infuriating than listening to a song there and you can't hear what the, the singer's singing about because some drummer's going nuts on the drums, you know. So I think there's times to play and times to stay back, and that's what I try and do in order to enhance the song, um, yeah. you know, and, 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 and give it a bit of beans when it needs it. 
for that's one of Steve's favourite expressions, giving it some beans. Um, new terminology to me, but uh, there you go. But um, yeah, and so trying to stay out of his way, you know, because there's there's obviously you know a message to be um, uh, you know delivered there. So um, I try and sort of stay out of all that as best I can, and um, give it a bit of a punch when there's when when it needs it, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like I say, he's a very musical drummer and it's admirable how he does think about all these things. Um, I don't know how many more plaudits can I give you? I don't know. I've well, given you enough. I'm running out of money now. <laughs> <laughs> but, Just... <laughs> but presumably, Terry, we started off talking about the, the musicians that you are working with, but presumably... You... You're not just going to accept anybody coming into the to the band. You you want people who can play as well as what you're used to. Yeah, it's um, it, it's been sort of challenging. Yeah, um, it's as, as Steve said earlier, it's getting the right um, formula there. You know, personality wise is 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 almost as important as sort of whether you can play your instrument. You know, because if you can't get on with people. Um, you know, the result is going to be disastrous in the end because, you know, bands split up because of that, egos, things like that. Um, I know it's early days for us at the moment, but uh, all the indicators are that these individuals are are, um, are, are, are going to be with us for some time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And actually, just to recap uh, you, you, your plans for XTC at the moment, I'm, I'm interviewing you only two gigs into your tour but you're building up i think you've already said to the, to the isle of wight and then you've got ambitions i believe for uh, uh november and then 2022 yeah well uh, there's rumor that we may be going to the states in march and april um but what uh, the the immediate thing is to see um how the dust settles after the isle of wight situation there because um we want to get involved with a couple of agents, promoters and so on and so forth there to sort of uh, try and uh, continue to get more work in the UK uh, throughout October, November and up to, up to December, which hopefully will take us to um, parts of the UK uh, further in, into the Midlands, the North and Scotland as well. Um, at the moment, we're just sort of like playing fairly locally at the moment there. As I say, as a, as a bit of a warm up type of thing there to the Isle of Wight, and once we realise where we're at, I mean, it'd be nice to go to Leeds and Liverpool and Manchester. But in order to go to those places, you know, you need at least half a dozen gigs back to back type of thing there to make it financially viable. Because we're not playing the massive arenas, where where a tour would consist of six gigs that ends up uh, ends up at Wembley. We've got to go if we're going to Leeds you know, Liverpool, Manchester, we need to be playing those places and perhaps two or three others at the same, uh, in the same week to justify the, the cost of, of putting these things together. So just the odd one-off driving to Edinburgh, for example, there just doesn't sort of seem to make much financial sense, really, because you still have to do the same amount of rehearsal and that for one gig as you do for six. So you know, it's a question of sort of cashing in while the band is still cooking. So we want to continue on throughout October and November if we can. Yeah. I mean, that's my plan. I just, I want to gig as much as possible. You know, that was the, one of the the tragic things for me when TC and I finished. It's, you know, Terry's too good to waste, really. You know, we, we need to be out there playing. You know, he's back in the game and I want to... Yeah, being a band with you, gigging as much as possible. Yeah, we want to have some fun and, mm. and get out there and, and take this music to places uh, in a generation of people potentially that have never seen this this stuff before. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully um, do it justice. So yeah, as well as you know, catching up with some older friends. I didn't say old, but <laughs> older friends. Um, you know, it'd be nice to sort of see some new faces and. Um, and a new generation of people there, and sort of give, you know, give them what for, really, and uh, hopefully a, a lot of bang for their buck. In that sense, you're seeing yourselves as a band in your own right, not just a tribute band or or a, or a kind of retro thing. Yeah, we're sort of like a a pub stroke club sort of band, rather than sort of like a, a stadium rock outfit at this point in time. I don't, I, I don't even think that if XDC would have continued on, they would have never been a real stadium band. We did it as support to 
you know, bands like the Cars and the Police and all that, but we were the support. Uh, under our own conditions, I think it's fair to say that Andy and Colin would have prepared, pre preferred to have played, you know, three to perhaps 5,000-seater venues, a little bit more um, comfortable sort of venues, and done those perhaps two, maybe three nights or something like that, rather than playing Madison Square Gardens for one night in a in a cavernous thing there where you can't even see people. It was just... I, I just don't see it as a, a, a musically enjoyable experience. I mean, I've been on both sides of it. I've played on the stage and I've been in the audience. And for me, from an audience point of view there, I just I just didn't think I, it was worth the money. No, it's not enjoyable. And I think actually you see it too intimate. The music is too sort of personal and, and human to translate very well into the stadium, I don't think. It's, yeah. yeah. It's not that type of Van yeah. Halen type thing. No, it's yeah. not. Even sort of comparable bands like REM or maybe U2, that they, they there is a sort of grand gesture in that music that that can work on that scale, but not. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's too many little yeah. corners and alleyways yeah. in XTC's music. REM never really struck me as being a stadium band. Stadium, maybe not. Band, you know, yeah. Talking Heads, likewise. Um, you know, there's certain bands there that uh, that require a certain intimacy, I think. You know, and you want to be comfortable what you're doing, and and you can deliver the goods, whereas you know, the big bands, you know, the Deep Purples, uh, the Van Halens, these, you know, Aerosmith, these type of bands. I mean, Def Leppard, they're, that's what, that's what, that's what they want. And, and, and in fairness, um, I suppose the Foo Fighters in this day and age are, are, are one of those sort of bands as well. But there is a demand for them sort of bands that um, I suppose they have to do those stadiums, you know, that's the thing. But the music almost fits that environment, doesn't it? Everything's yeah. very anthemic. Yeah, they they, they yeah, record right. they record their records in with yeah. that. In I yeah. mean, Def Leppard, for example, used Mutt Lang uh, to do this stuff, similar to ACDC, you know. But it's all about that the whole thing there. You think, yeah, this this it can only fit in a stadium because it's that big. Yeah. And that's the way they recorded these things, and they, that's the where they want to go. Wouldn't sound right in the dog and duck. Right? No, they couldn't get it right <laughs> in the dog and duck or the pig and the <laughs> I'm, this, uh, this is a bit of a random question, but I'm just thinking, Terry, that when you set out, uh, started playing 1972 or so, that that. If you think about it, that's only like 20 years from this after the start of rock and roll. <laughs> and now, if we talk about 20 years ago now, that's 2000. And one or something yeah maybe, uh, I, should, maybe, it's I, very maybe i should have left it where it was <laughs> well it's just well yeah maybe but but no that no you shouldn't have done that but 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 it it's it, basically you've you've lived through the story of rock and roll it's 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 a long it's become quite a long time hasn't it yeah well i actually started in 1969 1969. you actually invented rock and roll <laughs> yeah yeah well, even <laughs> then um you know um yeah, it was, it was during the period of time. I mean, obviously, that was the year of Woodstock. And, um, you know, there was a whole new generation of music sort of like coming through. So the whole, you know, the Chuck Berry thing, the uh, Big Bopper and Buddy Holly and all that sort of stuff there was, you know, I considered at that point time to be old music. But in actual fact, it wasn't really, was it? But uh, when you're 15, you just think that's old people's stuff. Yeah. So uh, I dare say people are thinking that exactly the same thing about us now, but uh, I'll have to, I'll, I, I'm unaware of it. Yeah, I, I got into XUC in 1979 and I thought I was very, very much behind the curve. Yeah. <laughs> and now, of course, oh, yeah. it doesn't feel like that now. No, not at all. No. And, uh, um, surprisingly, this stuff, uh, you know, despite the fact it's sort of 30, nearly 40 years old in some cases, uh, still sounds reasonably fresh you know it does it, yeah good the test of time i think you know but mm -hmm. you know, obviously if you listen to sort of like um you know old buddy holly song you know exactly when they where, where, where that's from yet yeah, this stuff can sort of find its way onto um a radio playlist there it wouldn't be out of place with some of the stuff that's around perhaps even today you know it's uh yeah. it's aged fairly well i think when you're playing your XTC set, do, does it feel like, oh, this is an old one or this is one of the newer ones? It's some of them, some of them do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's because perhaps I've played played those songs for quite a long time. But in general, I think um, you know the the, the the songs stand up even today. Have you changed 
because we've talked about the you learning new songs that you didn't play on, but have you changed the songs that you did play on? Have they? Have you just sort of link, uh, sort of switched back to how you used to play them? Pretty much, yeah. I think I'm playing them with a little bit more taste, perhaps these days, but um, not quite so much of a thrash. And I think they're, they're a little bit more musical than what they used to be. Um, I've tried to sort of like um, give them a bit of a sense of maturity as uh, as well as um, you know, some sort of dignity to the age from which they came. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the versions that we're we're doing of these songs they sort of stand up quite 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 favourably by today's standards. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to um, the, the BBC Live XTC album. You know, the yeah, is it BBC one? But I think it was a concert anyway. Yeah, and this is Hammersmith, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, great, as tight as you can get. But the, the tempos mm. were probably about 30, 40 yeah. BPM beats per minute faster than the original, yeah. which is great. And I, I love that energy. Yeah. I think there's a balance to be had, isn't there, where it can feel. Yeah. It, it, you know. they, they, keep, they, they have to be sung as well at that. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> yeah. the thing. It's, uh, it's not like garbling these lyrics out there. But at the time, there, it was sort of like. The spontaneity of being youth yeah. and um, testosterone yeah. up to the eyeballs, I suppose, and um, you know, giving it what uh, you know people sort of expected at that particular point in time. Yeah. Um, I mean, but um, yeah, it, it, it's remarkable how they managed to sing some of those things at that and, and get the point across, or or maybe they didn't. I don't know. Oh, it's exciting to listen. Yeah, to. really exciting. Yeah. Would you say that was when the XTC were, the, were at their live best around that period? Was, was there a sort of peak period in terms of your form? Well, I, I think I think it, it was at its best when we sort of ended, to be quite honest, because I think we had um, we started to get uh, a, a good set together with there wasn't a bad song in it, whereas early, in the early days we had a few fillers in there, I suppose, in order to make up the time. But by the time we'd sort of done our fifth or sixth album or whatever it was, you know, there was quite a catalogue of, of decent songs there. And, um, you know, each one of them, I, I, I think, sort of uh, had, had a lot of merit on their own, you know. So it was a good, it was developing into a good set. Besides that, we, we were becoming better musicians as well, I think, as a result of playing, you know, not only sort of um, the five or six albums and, and having recording experience, but songwriting experience as well became better. And the band was um, well until the you know the wheels fell off. We're, we're playing as well as what we we ever did, I think. Yeah. And Steve, now that you're playing these songs live, is is the other is the like one song that you always think, oh great, it's this one now that you always look forward to playing every night. Yeah. I mean, or is it? No, no, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> there's always two, there's always two sides to that's, that question. Yeah, yeah. That's question two. <laughs> I, I look at the set list and my heart sinks. No, <laughs> no, I love playing them all. It's such you know from the early energetic, almost quasi punk. XTC right through to the more beatly stuff. You know, I, I love it all. Um, the one song at the moment that I'm really enjoying is uh, No Language in Our Lungs because I love the guitar interplay and mm. I mean, it's a lot of words in it to remember. Uh, but yeah, and it's just such an emotive song, um, something to really get your teeth into. That's, that's what I'm most enjoying, but it can vary. Another one from later stuff. I, and I never really used to like playing it that much because I was never particularly fond of the song. But now I love it. The way we do it is big day mm. because you've given it some some beans to coin that phrase yeah. again. <laughs> you know, and it, it's br you brought the tempo. <laughs> I, I was playing it very ordinarily to begin with. And no, 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 no. It made, made an adjustment there. Ah, no, that's worth doing. It just needed that, yeah. you, you know, that yeah. extra but, tempo. But it's, yeah. it's it, once again, it's sort of like these things have been developed as we play them more. Mm. Um, you know, we're sort of like, you know, um, looking at them slightly differently, I think, and um, making minor adjustments as we go because it's a learning curve for all of us. And, um, you know, if we can sort of make some improvements uh, as we go, I think it's all good for the band. Mm. But that sort of, it, it did bring it to life, that sort yeah. of thing. Just giving it that extra yeah. um, speed. I, I don't know why I didn't think of it earlier. Well, I can't be a genius. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I was concentrating on something else. 
<laughs> and, and no language in our lungs. That that's one of the ones that you played on Terry originally on the record. Do, 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 how influential? How, how big was your input into into the sound of those drums on 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 those records? Did you? I get the impression anyway that that you had a a bigger and bigger say into into how the drums were recorded. Yeah. I think I think on those particular records there, well, as soon as they started working with uh, Steve Lillywhite and Hugh Padgham, you know, they just sort of like saw me as a bit of an animal on these things, and um, you know, just put me in in, in sort of a cave, and uh, you know, <laughs> the, the thing sort of became, had a, a life of its own from that point onwards. And I think there was only one way that the drums were going to go in that particular occasion. It's going to be like this. I, th- I think it was just sort of a a chance really that a we were in this stone room and it just made anybody drums even it made even phil collins drums sound good um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a joke um, <laughs> you know so uh, yeah it was one of those sort of things here it was hard to harness these things in there there's no point playing in there and then dampening these things down with tea towels and cushions and all the rest of it because you may as well have recorded it somewhere else so in that sense, um, it was only going to go one way, really. And um, fortunately, the songs lent themselves to it. You know, um, there, there were sort of, sort of big, sort of lots of Tom stuff going on there and, and um, very drum orientated for a couple of records that we did with those. And I think that links back to what Steve was saying earlier ab- about the constituent parts of, of, of certainly pre-1982 XUC, which is that every one of you had a distinctive role, you know, Colin's bass was distinctive, your drums were yeah. distinctive, Andy's uh, guitar parts were, 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 were very idiosyncratic and and Dave put, in some ways, putting the glue, the musical glue over the top of it. Um, it, meant, it meant that it was, every aspect of it was interesting. There was never a dull moment. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and I've been delighted to talk to you. So thank you very much for, for, for thank you for the music. That's another band, isn't it? But um, uh, it's been lovely talking to you and I'll, I'll, and I'll wave when I see you uh, in Portsmouth tomorrow. Yeah, wave money. <laughs> <laughs> you need it after the amount you're giving to Steve. You spend too much time in Scotland. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> money? Yes. <laughs> It's all cards now. Anyway, it's, I could just wave my contactless at you. Great talking to you, Mark. Anyway, yeah. thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much, Terry and Steve. The gig turned out to be just as wonderful as you'd expect, and the band managed to bring unity to songs as diverse as This Is Pop, No Language In Our Lungs, Sacrificial Bonfire, and Scatter Me. You can read what I thought on my blog at xdclimelight.com. But to take us out, let's hear what other people thought, starting with Julie Matthews talking about how the Portsmouth gig compared to the previous one in Swindon. And with Julie was her daughter, Eve Brown, who was seeing the band for the first time. Fantastic, as always. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how did it compare to the, to the Swindon last week? Well, equally, equally as good, but in a smaller setting, you know, more intimate, but you know, raising the roof again. So, really, really happy, and uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be seeing them again. Yeah, yeah. At least, at least twice. It's really good. I didn't expect it to be so good. It was my first time, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was so good, especially the second half. It was ten out of ten. Yeah, you just felt the energy like slowly rise and then it got better and better and better. Originally, like most of them, I didn't like know completely. I'd only heard like in the car or on the road trip. But um, yeah, towards the end, I was I was going for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. I keep on thinking about um, stupidly happy at the end. Oh, Sunday. it was but, so good. But... Yeah, and then it became just more and more relatable. You know, you just sort of think you listen into the lyrics the deeper you get into the concert, and it's just like ah, oh, you think about those happy memories, and it's just even better. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Dan uh, from Ecstatic. I had a great night tonight. I I just got caught up in it and all the tunes were brilliant and the band was amazing. I try to catch everyone's eye going, come on, you know the words to this one, don't you? I've met new friends tonight coming to me going, I never met another XTC fan who knows the words as well as I. I go, you have no idea. You have no idea, mate. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Um, I'm Chris Hart. I've just seen uh, XTC and an absolutely fabulous show. Just uh, just heard Life Begins a Hop. Uh, great early song. 
full of energy. They nailed it. But uh, I never actually got to see XTC in their heyday, but to, that was absolutely superb. And it's a half time show, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. He's one of my drumming heroes. I would drum it myself. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he's just a machine, uh, but he absolutely knocks it out of the park every time. Uh, I'm called Cathy, and I used to work on a magazine called Smash Hits. In fact, I was part of the team that launched it. Fantastic. And there was a guy called Andy Partridge who used to come along and and, um, um, and critics or yeah, um, give his views on certain uh, records, and he became part of the team. And I have been a fan ever since, but not quite as much as this guy. But, yeah, life begins at the hop was great. He was a crazy man then. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful company. Yeah. My name is Greg. Um, regarding Scatter Me, how it was performed, um, I thought the telling did particularly well with the um, operatic part. But he made it his own. He made it his own. Um, and it was a different, a different thing. Um, but it was nice to hear it as part of the set now, along with all the XTC material. Yes, yes, so that was good. You know, the whole spectrum of XTC. And um, even though Terry didn't play on some of the original later, set the sort of the second half of their career, because he's now playing those songs, it's almost like, you know, he never went away, to me personally, anyway. My name's Stacey. Um, Generals are made as well, obviously one of their biggest hits. But we were just saying, because XTC hasn't, haven't played live since the 80s, so we just don't think they're underestimating how much of a problem there will get. You know, because to see XTC live, it just, it's just a great thing, and it brings you back, soundtrack of our lives and all that, you know, brings yeah, back yeah. memories, really good memories. Yeah. Such, a, such a classic 80s sound. One of the best drummers ever. He's amazing. Without it, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. But, yeah, if you get a drum machine, so that man is just perfect, yeah. 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 Really amazing yeah. time, yeah. yeah. My name's Steve Austin, right, I'm from Portsmouth, and I saw uh, XTC at the Locarno, which we also called the Mecca. Small place, it's fantastic. Uh, with the original lineup, Barry Andrews and the rest of them. They were, they were terrific. So much energy, and it just, just really hit the spot. And the first time I saw them, they did uh, science fiction, and it was on some program. We think maybe I'll go to test or something. And they were, they were terrific. They really hit it down. You were watching them. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they were great. Yeah. 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 So, so then you hear all these years later, or is it 50 years later? 40 yeah. Years later, you're, well, you're, you're, well a lot of the stuff I didn't know because yeah. I know more about the first yeah, the three or four albums, especially the first two. But I thought I separated the the XTC thing and made it. That was like this band. That was a different band. Yeah. And this guy made it. He did really well. I think yeah, he made it yeah. his own. So. And, and the other thing is, a good tune work. A good song will work anywhere. Yeah. A, a good song. Then they did it. And I didn't know them, but they, they a lot of these tunes. But a good song. Yeah. Will transcend. Yeah. So you had a good night. I had a great night. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Eddie Lawrence from Romsey, stupidly happy. I've waited so many years for that song to be played live. I never thought I would hear it played live, but this evening, I've, I'm, I'm stupidly happy for hearing stupidly happy. <laughs> it did hold its own, Mark, and the reason was, was because it's a great pop song, and it, it, it fused in well with, the, with, if you like, the greatest hits that they were, on, they were playing tonight. Yeah, they were crowd pleasers, and it was just great to be out there hearing XTC songs played live again. <sighs> Since 1978, I've known who Terry Chambers is, OK? And obviously, he left the band in 1982, 83, for, uh, for whatever reasons. I never thought that I would actually be shaking hands with Terry Chambers tonight and having a, a photo with him. What a charming man he is. He's a fabulous guy. Yeah. And I very much look forward to seeing the band again, yeah. which I will be in about 10 days' time at the Isle of Wight Festival. I'm really looking forward to it, and that's the reason why I'm going to the Isle of Wight Festival. From Compton, uh, my song of the night, Making Plans for Nigel, as a really amateur guitarist I've been trying to play it for the last 40 years <laughs> it sounds very simple but it's it's difficult to to execute so did you learn tonight um probably not no but I mean <laughs> I just um sit at home and multi-track myself but I still can't get it right, right and I don't right. think I ever will but yeah. that says a lot about me and not a lot it's is. virtually impossible to play and sing at the same time so you had a good time. Yeah, great time. Yeah, yeah. great time. 
I'm A. Swatridge. Sacrificial bonfire, something I never thought I'd see live. Um, one of the best tracks on Skylarking, and uh, how they're going to carry that off without all the instrumentation and the backing strings and things on there. But uh, they did, and it was great. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. I don't know what that thing he was playing with the guitar, but uh, it was it made a fantastic sound. It was great, and um, you know they carried off a lot of the songs that I thought they'd never attempt live, and uh, it was everything was fantastic all the way through. Yeah, loved it. Well, I've been th I've been I've been I've been an XTC fan, obviously, you know, as long as I can remember. The, since the uh, 3D EP oh, was the first thing I bought, yeah. And I never thought that um, I would see them after they effectively stopped touring in you know early 80s, and I thought that would be it. But uh, this year, what you've had a new Colin Moulding record, a new Andy Partridge record, and they've. They've gone on tour, you know, XTC have gone back on tour, so what? It's a great year to be an XTC fan. What do you call that noise? He's right, you know. Thanks to Terry Chambers, Steve Tilling, Karen Neal, Dan Barrow, Julie Matthews, Margaret Brown, Alex Brown, Laura Brown and Eve Brown, and also to Mark Thomas, Daryl Bullock and Jamie Dunn for contributing some of the questions. And many, many thanks, of course, to the podcast supporters on Patreon who make it all possible, including the following nights in Shining Karma. Terry Arnott, Matt Bell, Kevin Burt, Liam Duggan, Jamie Dunn, Helen Fay, Peter Fermoy, Leslie Gooch, Robert Graham, Marek Krauss, Jasper Kumberg, Robert Lawlor, Dennis LeCourier, Liz Lynch, Ian Morris, uh, Yusuf Murra, Amy Parkinson, Murray Meikle, Kevin Murray, Karen Neal, Mark Reed, James Reimer, Simon Slatehome, Michael Sutcliffe, Mark Thomas, Nigel Waller, and William Wickstrom. If you'd like to support the XDC podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. Thanks very much for listening. Back next month with even more XTC goodness. See you then. What do you call that noise? Head to xtclimelight.com where you can buy my two XTC books. First, there's the XTC Bumper Book of Fun for Boys and Girls, which is an anthology of Limelight, the XTC fanzine I made from 1982 to 1992. We had a couple of lifelines to the world, and, and Limelight was one of them. So the book is the XTC Bumper Book of Fun for Boys and Girls. It's stunning. Thank you, Ian Lee. And then there's What Do You Call That Noise, an XTC discovery book, where you'll find more from the band, plus commentary from musicians, including Anton Barbo. For me, it's just simply a life-changing song. And McHugh. It's like a painting by Van Gogh. Jason Faulkner. XTC probably made the most impact on me of, of any band that I can think of. Chris Butler. If there's anything more classic XTC e -E -E -E. this is it and Rick Buckler it was well produced as well it had the support of a great producer I mean it really sounded strong order your copies of both books at xtclimelight.com it's a paper and ink net the internet with, with added staples